Hi, everyone. I'm Marilyn Moore, here with John Moore, and this is the Small Business Web Tech Show, and we are very excited today to have just the most amazing guest, and that is David Amerland. <coughs> We're going to be talking Hi, about <laughs> <laughs> SEO help for small business. Um, before we, we're just going to take a moment for a little bit of um, acknowledgement of our sponsors. Oh, <laughs> let's pay attention here. Okay. And we are here at the office of the Oceanside Chamber of Commerce in beautiful Oceanside. We're a stone's throw from the beach. And they are um, a great uh, promoter, of course, of small business and very active chamber. And those are some of the events that they sponsor throughout the year. And uh, we are, John and I, are Sonic Spider LLC. Right Start Websites is where we... Um, are active on Google Plus, and we also have SonicWebTech.com for on-demand tech support. And uh, the man behind the scenes is Rich Pete Hanna, and his uh, company is Create a Q uh, Computer Network, and he is the IT guy. And here he is. And there he is. We can't show him because of our setup, but there is a picture of the wizard. Yeah. And our guest today, of course, is David Amerland, who is... Um, just one of the most amazing people I've had the pleasure of meeting, not in real life, but feel like it because of our Google Plus uh, connections and, of course, uh, Google, uh, Google Plus Hangouts. And, and the. Don't you go to David? I am. I am. <laughs> and he is uh, an author, a, a business analyst, speaker, and just a, an amazing communicator. All righty, David. Let's. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where in the world you are today? Because you're all over well, the I mean, place. I am indeed. I'm in Greece for the next um, ten days, nine days actually, and then I'm in Sofia, after that Bulgaria for a while, and then I'm coming back, and then I may be going to Germany, Frankfurt for a while. Wow. And I have to say, uh, let everybody know that he is. In Greece right now, it is 12:30. That's after midnight, and he has been gracious, gracious enough to join us for this hangout. So thank you so much, David. Oh, no, it's a real pleasure. I think what I you guys doing amazing. Full full of your energy. <laughs> <laughs> I have good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's my problem. I don't drink coffee. I, mean, I should take it up. Great coffee. Great coffee. <laughs> coffee. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, just to dive into our, our topic here, I'm going to um, quote a statistic from an article. I have put the link into the comments and in the event details of an article that David wrote called The Economic Impact of Search. And one of the, well, it's not startling, I guess, when you think about it, but it does kind of hit you between the eyes that there's a hundred and 19 billion dollar impact on the US economy alone from um, search so small businesses have got to, t to take notice of this and um, David's newest book yep. SEO help is what we're going to be talking about here today uh, using that as our, our, our base point it's a wonderful guide uh, very readable, very understandable for any business, but it, it works beautifully for small business. And uh, this is an excerpt from, this, from the introduction, which I think sums up the, Im the imperative for learning about this topic. Um, he says, search has gone from an activity that entered a business's marketing toolkit as an afterthought to be being one that is directly responsible for a business's success. In plain speak, Search is marketing. If your business cannot be found on the web, it cannot do business. So with that premise, then the obvious question is, what do I need to do about that? And so first of all, um, even though this book, David, is, is written for any business, it seems like you have the small business person in mind, or at least 
close to your heart <laughs> when you were writing this because it really seems tailor-made for small business. Did you have that focus or is that just how it worked out? <laughs> Well, um, yes and no. I mean, the, the book itself is a result of two years of talking about semantic search with um, Fortune 500 marketing teams. The questions they have are very similar. And what's happened with semantic search, what's happening with the semantic web we are finding ourselves in, is that a small business is operating the same data sphere as a large one. And a small business is targeting the same type of customer as a large one. So the segmentation and fragmentation of the past, which allowed us to sort of segment marketing into smaller budgets and bigger budgets, doesn't really work anymore. Uh, sure, I mean, certainly there's still bigger and smaller budgets, yeah. but w what they're actually doing in terms of um, practices are almost identical. And the difference is that, you know, a large company has perhaps more manpower to throw at it, and the smaller one doesn't. Yes. They, they all struggle with very similar problems. Well said. Um, you have in, in the book, you have 20 steps or, or 20 activities that need to be undertaken. And um, I'm going to take a minute, maybe this is splitting hairs. The steps are very clear and simple to understand, but I for the most part, would not call them easy, kind of a simple versus easy here, except maybe the first few. It seems to be a, a little bit of a progression. So um, I think that that uh, action list at the end, though, where you have 10 questions for businesses to ask themselves uh, is really important because if you go through those questions, then it really, it's almost, it's not that it's easy to do, but it's almost uh, impossible not to understand what you should be doing. So I think that is is really a, a great part, even though it's one that people might be tempted to breeze through who read the book. I think that's really um, key. But um, that seems, it's, even though you didn't necessarily have this with small business in mind, it seems like in some areas small business actually has an advantage, though, over those uh, gigantic competitors, um, would you agree that there's some small business advantages there? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, small businesses, funnily enough, have for the first time since the web came along the opportunity to, to stand on an even footing with their large arrivals. Uh, you know, when, when the internet, you know, when the web first came, everybody thought, okay, you know, finally we have a great leveler. Um, the, all you need is a website, a little bit of quality writing, and you can be work from home and perhaps be as good as Walmart with all their millions and, and social media teams and web designers. And that was true for a while until obviously big business became got wise of this. They developed you know their websites and they brought in tools and skills and succeeded in basically overshadowing the small guy. And now we're back to that level playing field. If you have a small business, what you have to do is the same as a large business. The difference is that you can do it a lot faster, a lot easier, and at a lower cost than your large arrival, who has to essentially train the internal teams to speak with one voice, project the kind of image that will actually resonate, get the kind of engagement in social media and across the web, which will help them um, surface their content. So from what I can see, if you have a small business, you actually are um, at, 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 a, at a higher advantage than a larger one. The thing which you will find hard is finding enough time and discipline to actually do what you have to do. Now, funnily enough, that's the same problem large businesses have. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the social media teams of the large Fortune 500 companies I, I deal with tell me the same thing. We haven't got enough hours in a day. We work nine to five and our customers uh, you know, have a, a larger contact window. And if it's a global market, then we have a 24-7 window. And we can't do that. So they actually struggle with the same things, even though on paper there's a lot more of them, they have a lot more manpower collectively, and they have bigger budgets and fa fancier toys to play with. But that gives you an idea of the measure of the, of the, of the portion of the challenge, perhaps. And also it allows you to think that 
if you work clever, you've got to work smarter, not necessarily harder, then you can find ways around it. And as a small business, which a larger one can't because of the way they're actually laid out at the moment. Uh, you made such a great point, though, th about time being a factor for everybody. But I think the factor th that comes in more for small business is you also said discipline because yes. there's no one making you do it. You have mm. to uh, exert that discipline yourself. And that's where um, we were talking earlier before uh, the broadcast began about motivation, which we'll get into, too. Mm. To, to well, yeah, sure Jonathan mentioned... He mentioned intrinsic motivation as opposed to external motivation. And what usually happens in a larger business, there's a process there which acts as an external motivation for people to do something. And they have to do it within a certain time frame and they get have targets to meet and they get assessed on that. If you work for yourself, if you work in a small, um, small business team, well, the motivation has to be intrinsic. Yes. Now, funnily enough, for both the large operator and the small operator, the solution is the same. It's clear internal communication. So if you're in a small team, everybody must speak the same language, but they must understand exactly what they're doing, they must understand why they're doing it, they must understand the imperatives they actually face and create for themselves the discipline through an intrinsic motivation. For a larger team, if you talk about uh, you know, a big conglomerate, they have to create processes which create an external motivation. So you can see that it's harder for them to do it and more costly than it is for a smaller team. Discipline is key to both, so you know it has to start with that. Very, very true. Yeah. Um, you call the recommendations in your book that we're going to be talking about here semantic search steps because yes. semantic search is disrupting many of the practices associated with traditional search engine optimization techniques. What do people need to know about semantic search in order to implement and be successful with? your recommendations. What, what okay, let's, let's start with how it, what it is because a lot of people hear it and think, okay, what is it? And if you go to Google and actually look at it, it looks exactly the same that it did before, four years yeah. ago. It hasn't changed <laughs> visually, but it has changed in the way it works. Now, what semantic search does is it surfaces information which is contextual, it's in context, and intentionally driven. So basically, it understands the intention of the person who does the search and then it creates the right context for that information to actually surface. And it uses a number of signals. But essentially what it does is, is it tries to understand the information almost the same way that a person would, so that it can, it can give you the right answer at the right time to the right person. So that's what it does. And if you think about that, suddenly you realize that a small operator, large operator difference suddenly evaporates. Because if we're looking at the right information, at the right time to the right person, anybody who fulfills the, that criteria will actually be able to surface. It doesn't matter if you have a 13,000 people strong team or a three people strong team. All you have to do is basically meet the criteria, which then makes you realize as a small business, the primary question here is understand what you do and then ask, is that reflected outside my business? If I get on the web, do other people see what I do? Have they got a clear idea of how I do it, why I do it, how good I am? So these are the very basic questions. These are the things which actually need to come across. And this is you know, plain English. We're moving away from the technicalities, and we're trying to find ways to actually make them come on the web, which then will be able to increase visibility in semantic search. OK, we have a couple of comment tracker comments and stuff. First yep. of all, Omi okay. uh, gave us a really nice link to uh, 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 small business competing with brands on SEO, Can which is really good. Uh, right. Yeah, could you, could you? Uh, oh, and then, uh, then we have another How one. Can we bring it up? Though? Yeah. Rich, scroll down. Just no, oh, scroll down. Here. Yeah, scroll down. Here. No, down, <laughs> down. Right there, that link. We're getting there. No, no, there. no, don't, don't click the there. link. Click the eyeball. That's it. We're getting there. There we go. So uh, thank you for that, so, because that's a, a nice link, and, and it makes David's point there very well. Mm -hmm. And then right above that, Rich is John Ellis has a comment, so click that one. About consistency, 
Cause... Uh, yeah, that's that's the one we all struggle with is being consistent, and that's that's a biggie, right? Well, yeah. that's why it is. And, and if I may interject something here, sure. this is where big companies usually have an advantage because they have processes or they create processes which drive consistency so that they know what they start off this with this month, for instance, is going to go on for the next 12 months because this is what the process is, this is what the steps are, and somebody needs to do them. Somebody will actually get assessed for them. So it becomes somebody's job. In a small, in a small business environment, uh, this doesn't happen because you know you constantly reprioritize things. Mm -hmm. So, totally understandable. You have to find a way to get past that. Not necessarily by creating a process which is as rigid as your large opponents, but one which creates the same kind of consistency long term because you understand the imperatives. Now, it's fine if you know, out of 30 days in a month, you spend five days doing something else primarily because that is key for those five days. And then you spend, you know, the rest 25 days doing what you should be doing in terms of search visibility and social media visibility and so on. But you need to have the kind of understanding and discipline to actually do it. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's the one thing that small businesses consistently struggle with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of, one of the things that we're going to get to George, George's... Uh, message here, but one, one of the things that I really like about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, show that we had with Mark was the concept of Mark trapping. Mark trapping and was that um, the whole idea about, you know, the horses before the cart and that is there's a bunch of things that you can do that are useful, mm -hmm. that get you ready. Yes. And those things in and of themselves are good to do. Even if you only do number one or number two, you're still way ahead of the game. And yes. a lot of that in your book and, and that concept is very valuable. And, and I think that's one of the messages I want to put out there for your book. And that is you could randomly pick a section and just say, I'm doing this. And that's it. That's all I'm doing, nothing else. I think yeah. they're going to get something out of that. And that's, that's one of the beauties here. You don't have to look at the book and say, oh, my God, i got to do all of this. No way. <laughs> yes. no, I, I, well, I don't think you need to look at it that way. I think you need to, to to pick your pick your thing that fits you and start doing it and and maybe you'll get to them all someday, but if you yeah. don't, you're still ahead of the game. You're probably, as Mark mentioned, you're probably doing a whole lot more than anybody else is doing <laughs> in in yes. your small business marketing. You know, exactly. For small businesses, the message to always have in mind is that doing something is better than doing nothing, and mm -hmm. and. Doing your own stuff and understanding why is better than having somebody do it for you. And I think you know the experience that um, Jonathan had. Oh, sorry, Ken was um, you know uh, basically he, he tried to get people to do it for him and he couldn't. And you know this is the a problem which happens frequently with businesses when you feel you don't have the time to learn. You think you're going to go to a professional, you're going to give them money, they're going to do it for you. And usually what happens is they take your money and they do very little. And unfortunately, uh, it's totally bad, I get it, it's deplorable, it happens so many times that essentially business owners have to take responsibility themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting a little bit of knowledge and working with it, that's a must these days. Right. Okay, let's get back to George's post there. You got it pinned there? Oh, there we go. He was wondering about the meaning of SEO, whether it's still relevant it was years ago, or should it be renamed? <laughs> what do you well, think, <laughs> well, you know, I, I totally get what, he, what George is saying. You know, search engine optimization seems a little bit constrained these days, especially as search these days is also part of marketing, it's part of branding, it's part of identity creation. It's part of your social media engagement interaction. It's part of your human-to-human -human connection. So the answer is yes, but you know, uh, there's so many things which actually we have to do these days and learn that that's the least of our concerns. So if we stick with the traditional SEO and we bear in mind that it's not just on-site, on-page optimization anymore, then you know we just have to work with it. But I, I totally get it. And you know, yeah, a couple of years ago we had a tremendous discussion about this. It didn't get us anywhere in terms of finding an, an, an alternative name. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first steps you talk about in SEO Help, the book SEO Help, is establishing your online identity. What you yes. do, how you do it, your, your uniqueness, your mission, your passion. Often this is uh, also a big part of branding. Um, and 
you also f focus first on your business website as a key to establishing your online identity. And would you uh, explain why that online identity is so important and how those two connect? your website and your yeah, online. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, I mean, let's start with easy answers first. Now, essentially, what people do these days is they connect with people, you know, so they have to have a clear idea who they're connecting with. And when you connect with people, you're connecting not with just a name, but also a person who stands for something. And that something is your common ground and, you know, the, the point of connection. They speak the same language as you, perhaps. They, have, they share the same culture. They share, they share the same experiences or the, or the same values. When you do business with a business, really you're doing business with the people behind it. And you need to be able to understand who they are and what they do. And this is where the idea of identity actually comes in. We used to go on the web, and it didn't matter if you were somebody working from your back bedroom at home or somebody working for a large company. Everybody was glossy website, customer-centric, results-orientated, top-notch business, right? I mean, nobody said, we're a mediocre small business. We're likely to take your money and perhaps <laughs> not fulfill the order. <laughs> yes. So we're moving away from that. Really, if I get on a website, you know, I need to see the people behind it. I need to get a sense of what makes them unique. To give me the same blunt language that I will, you know, meet on a, on a perhaps, you know, Walmart website or, or, a, or a Target website makes, you know, it doesn't really fill me with confidence. It doesn't help me connect. It makes no difference at all from a customer point of view in terms of actually closing a sale. So really, for a business now, and this is where small businesses have an advantage, you need to get your identity across. You know, if you're working from a back bedroom, there's no problem with that because everybody knows this anyway. This is what the web is designed to do. You know, yes, I'm working from my mom's basement and I'm selling, you know, I don't know, whatever. But I'm really passionate about what I do and I'm going to send it to you and you send me the money. I think that's brilliant. That's person-to-person -person connection. Transparent, honest. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I may as well help somebody working from there than send my money to Target, for instance, for a big conglomerate and really don't need my 25 bucks. So this is, this is the kind of thinking which makes things real. And the moment it makes things real, it also makes them um, critical to the identity and the passion and the personality behind them. And, and this is where your own website comes in as well, essentially, because that's your primary platform from getting some of that across. This is where a lot of the efforts which you do across the web will point back to in order for you to do business, right? Because if you're active on Facebook, you're not going to sell on Facebook. You're using Facebook to promote your website so people can come on your website and actually buy something from you. The same thing when you're on Twitter or Instagram or Google Plus or, or any other social, you know, LinkedIn. Um, so you need to have that centralized presence. You need to make it as real as possible. You need to be honest with yourself first. And again, from a small business perspective, that's a lot easier than it is for a large company, which has all sorts of issues to deal with before it actually becomes that kind of um, transparent to its customers. So, you know, do the hard thinking, decide, why am I in business? Why am I working? What do I want to establish and achieve beyond the fact that you need to make a living? Everybody needs to do that. But beyond that, there's something else that actually drives you. The moment you understand that, then you have to ask, Am I projecting that adequately across the web? Is that coming across on my website um, literature, in the things I write, in my blog posts, in my photographs? In the, you know, does, does my passion for quality come across in the products which I actually have on the web? Or am I using generic copy like everybody else? Mm -hmm. So these are, these are the things which actually make a big difference. Yeah. One of the things uh, that uh, I just encountered, and it's a little story here, I uh, was trying to get a landscaper for uh, my wife's aunt's house uh, this last week. And so I, you know, I looked at all different landscapers and I went to all the different places and I found one that seemed to have the right message on their website and I liked what was said and stuff. So, so I called him and I talked to him and he, you know, he answered the phone and that's great. And we set up appointment for the next day. He never showed up. <laughs> After calling him twice yeah. more. <laughs> then, then I call. Then I thought, well, maybe he lost my phone number. Okay, I'm going to give him a break. So I call him up, and I leave, and he doesn't answer, and I leave my phone number. Nothing. <laughs> Two hours later, I call him up again. I call him up again, leave my phone number, ask him to call me. Nothing. Monday morning, I call him again, leave my phone number. Here we are, Tuesday. Nothing. So, John, you're verging on to stalking behavior here. <laughs> 
Well, I'm I'm trying to give the guy a real big break. I'm trying to assume that hey, you know, this is he's busy, you know, whatever. But the point being is, you can have the beautiful website, you can have all of this stuff, but if you don't get down and return the phone call, yeah. you're you yeah. know you're out of business, yeah. and that's and that's the thing we got to to not lose track of that we well, have to this follow is through. This is, the, this is where consistency actually comes in. Now, if that was a big business, it'd be somebody's job to actually reply. And it'd be somebody's job to actually measure that. It'd be somebody's job to see that all this is happening. So there would be a chain, which is a process, which would have allowed you to feel that you were valued, that your phone call was listened to, that you were responded to, and you would have decided to give them your money and close the business. And the thing is, from a quality point of view, they may not have been any better. And probably might have been worse than somebody working on their own. Now, maybe the person you contacted is tremendously unprofessional and you, you know, quite rightly you decided after all that that you, know, you didn't <laughs> want to do business with them. But maybe also they simply are busy because they happen to be really good. And not having established a process, they prioritize things depending on, you know, if they're working on my garden, for instance, he can't return your call even though he wants to also work on your garden, but he can't because he's prioritizing things in the wrong way or he hasn't got some way of actually dealing with that. And I think this is a classic example of actually not prejudging the situation here but keeping in mind the pressures that a small business actually faces and working smart, finding ways to get around it. You know, if you think that you're going to be busy in, in a certain segment of time and you know, for instance, that you need to reply to social media uh, comments or reply to emails or reply to phone calls coming in, find a mechanism that actually makes it work for you. You know, find, you know, there are a lot of tools out there. They're listening, they're, they're answering machines, they're automated services, they're, auto, they're call forwarding services when it comes to calls. There are automated tools which help you track and store the comments which come on social media so you can actually respond to them later on. So this is the things where, you know, you need to be clever. This is where, you, come, you know, working smarter rather than harder. You don't need to be on your laptop 24-7 because you still need to make a living. But by using these tools, you, you can actually begin to, to work better. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, go on. <laughs> well, everybody wants tips. I want tips. <laughs> so, um, would you, um, are there certain business strategies that produce, would produce the quickest SEO gains, in yes. your opinion? Yes. Okay. There are a few things. Now, first of all, and bear in mind, you know, this is the same whether you're, you know, um, Target or a guy working from your mom's basement. <laughs> this is what you need. You need absolutely rock solid, reliable hosting. You need this because um, Google looks at hosting. If your hosting is, you know, it's one of those six ninety nine a month and it's got ninety seven percent uptime. Well, I'm sorry, but that three percent downtime is actually important from Google's pro point of view. And Google also takes the point of view that if you can't be bothered to have reliable hosting, then how good a business are you really? Which means that you're not really wedded into what you're doing and the end user experience is going to be poor, so it becomes a bad quality mark against you. The other thing is your website needs to be fast and needs to load quickly. And you also need to have a mobile website or at least you know, you need to have the kind of design that actually looks okay in small screen as it does on a big screen. Mm -hmm. Now, loading time is important because when we're on mobile, we're dealing with lower bandwidth. Um, Google has figures that show that uh, if it takes longer than half a second for a, a mobile website to load, you have a 37 to 42% abandonment rate, which is, you know, it's pretty high. Yes. <laughs> so we need, to, we need to bear this in mind. So these are the things which are, give you instant win. You know, they actually help you, um, you know, begin to sort of uh, improve your SEO without doing anything magical, right? You're doing very basic business steps. Now, the other thing, of course, which you need to do, from my point of view, always, if you need the greatest shortcut when it comes to um, search engine optimization, is you need a Google Plus presence. And the reason you need that is because Google Plus essentially allows you to create the kind of signals that search sees, reads, understands, and then it helps you surface on search. So to give an example, suppose you have a, a Google Plus page as a business and you post an original post there about a particular product or a particular service. Within minutes of posting, that is going to be on Google's index. And then depending on the interaction and the engagement and the quality of your post, 
that's going to show up on Google search. So suddenly, as a small operator on a single post, you're going to be on Google search for that query. So you know, if you think that this is an instant win in terms of SEO and visibility, you're going to be there. And depending on how you have th things set up, how you have linked everything up, you can also show up in mobile search. You can show up on YouTube, depending on, on what you have there. And you'll certainly show up on, on desktop search. Well, um, you mentioned, of course, this whole thing on Google+. And this was something we were talking about before the show here with our, our in-person audience also. And it's also something that you um, discuss in your SEO help book that a lot of the transition over to Google+, particularly for uh, people maybe on Facebook, is, is can be challenging. Uh, a lot of the things that work on Facebook or some of the other social platforms pretty much fall flat on uh, Google+. And it's yes. um, a, a big stumbling block for our small business people. Uh, a lot of people have started with Facebook, and maybe they were on it for personal reasons before they switched over to using it for their business or added using it for their business. And then they come over to Google+, and get quickly frustrated because they're using it uh, what they're used to doing isn't working, and it feels complicated, and it kind of gets um, abandoned and sometimes bad-mouthed. So um, what are your thoughts on helping people transition over to Google Plus from their other social networks that they're used to using? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. In 2011, pretty much, uh, you know, when the moment Google Plus came along, towards actually 2012, as, as we got into you know, just past Christmas, one of my um, global customers created a Google Plus page because they knew it was important. They created the page, they put in three posts, and that's it. <laughs> Didn't do anything for a year after that. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> now, you can see the reason they behaved like that is because all they knew it was important. We, we, you know, we had a week-long workshop explaining the importance of that. So they actually had the knowledge of how important it is. But they gave it to the social media team, and the social media team works on Facebook and Twitter primarily. And they tried to work in the same way with Google+. Plus. They got frustrated very quickly because they couldn't see how they could connect with the public. They couldn't see how they're going to get any feedback. So they thought, OK, it's too difficult. We have a presence there. We're going to leave it there. We're going to go away. We'll come back at a later date. It's now two years plus later, and they're just coming back. And they're beginning to do it properly. But it's taken that long to actually understand the real value of what they're getting. Mm -hmm. Now, how important is it? It is critically important. In, in semantic search and semantic web, Google joins up all the little dots of your digital footprint and your digital identity. And this is where trustworthiness actually comes in. This is where expertise comes in. So if you're doing landscape gardening, for instance, well, you know, if you only have your website and you tell me you're the greatest landscape gardener in the world, so do all your competitors because they will say they're also the greatest landscape gardener in the world. And I'm not a landscape gardening expert. I'm just going to the website. I'm going to read the same things. I'm going to read in your competitor site and so on and so on. So then, you know, the only way I can actually differentiate between the quality of what you offer is if somebody else has some kind of experience of your service. And this is where social media comes in, the reputation, and actually building that up. And Google is also looking at joining up all the different areas of where you are actually at. So if you're on Twitter, he wants to know your Twitter identity and join it up and think, ha, you've got this website and you also got a Twitter presence and you also got a Facebook presence and also you've got a Google Plus presence and they can see that all these little things are joined up and you've got a YouTube channel and I'm beginning to trust you more than your competitors who only seem to have a website and nobody seems to interact with it. Mm -hmm. So even though they say exactly the same things, you become more trustworthy, you begin to rank higher in search, you begin to surface a lot more on the social web, you get more traffic, people engage with you, and ultimately people do business with people. So if I get a sense that, hey, people are talking about you, which means that there's a character behind and a personality behind your business and they engage with it. If people are talking about your services, which means that they've experienced them and they trust them, then I'm likely to trust them as well. And trust is key to everything. Without trust, no relation exchange will take place. You know, no information will be accepted, no service is going to be bought, no money is going to be sent, nothing will happen. And in order to build trust, you need that kind of connection. And Google Plus even though I'm not experienced um, in the other networks 
nearly to this as to the degree as um, my activity on Google Plus, but Google Plus is really great for building that trust because it tends to encourage uh, the kind of people that are on Google Plus are expecting the engagement, the more in-depth conversations. And the Google Plus Hangouts, of course, is another way to accelerate that trust building process. So it seems like Google Plus is one of the best ways in social media to, to generate that trust. However, it's a smaller audience. So how, how can those two be reconciled? Well, it, it is. Okay, you're absolutely right. It is one of the best ways. It's also one of the hardest because because you're dealing with people now who actually engage with you and interact and discuss and comment on what you do. You can't just broadcast to them your message and think, okay, my job is done. I told them I'm the best landscape, landscape garden in the world, which is what happens on Twitter, which is what happens in Facebook and Instagram in many ways. Um, so really, that kind of engagement allows you to become more human, allows you to become more connected, allows you to fine-tune your digital identity in your approach and your presence. And now we say, you know, it's a small audience. You're absolutely right, it is. It's a smaller audience than Facebook, perhaps. I mean, this is arguable, because on Facebook, you're not going to be reaching 1.2 billion people. You're only going to be reaching a certain circle within your location. Now, Google Plus has overall about half or just over half um, Facebook's users and a lot fewer active users. But that's not why you're using it. I mean, you're using it for, for partially for that kind of connection. But why you're really using it is because you're building up your reputation and you're increasing your visibility. And this is how it increases, okay? It's pretty much a small world phenomenon where a friend of a friend recommends you to somebody else. So suppose your target audience for landscape gardener is right, you know, two streets away from you. But they don't know you do landscape gardening because you haven't talked to them and they haven't talked to you and you haven't canvassed your neighborhood with leaflets. So, but they happen to be on Google Plus and they, their friend is a friend of a friend who actually knows you. So suddenly your connection comes up in search as a recommendation because of a friend of a friend when a personalized search comes in and you find your potential customer in your locality simply because of your extended chain of connections on, on Google+. And this kind of amplification of message is really important. Um, we did a study about uh, a month ago on a Hangout on Air and we saw that it reached an audience of 2.7 million people. This is not 2.7 million people who interacted with it, but 2.7 million people actually saw the engagement and the, and the hashtags and the brand. So the audience is pretty large. So if you continue to do that as a brand, suddenly you have the same kind of branding capability and brand reach as a big business. And, and the thing which makes Google Plus difficult is that there are a lot of tools there. And you need to take your time understanding them, you know, because there's a comments and threads and communities and hangouts on there and picture sharing and hashtags and podcasts, to, which you include in the stream. So it, it actually takes a little bit of time to unpack and you need to decide what you need to lead with. You know, you can't tackle everything at once, especially if you're a small business constrained for time. You always start off with your strongest um, move. Okay, we have a couple more comments on if you scroll down, George, down just a little bit, uh, on uh, the next one down. Okay. Down, down, next one down, that one. What are you looking at? This one? I'm looking at the comment tracker. Okay, <laughs> it's internal here, yeah. He's talking about uh, load time and and uh, the com and content management. This is from Steve. Can from you comment Steve. on load time and content management systems? Um, yes. Well, um, not specifically, but I mean, if you're looking at essentially some of the biggest uh, um, content management systems which are out there, well, you have WordPress, which is optimized to work well within um, a Google environment. You have Joomla. And then you have uh, some of the paid ones um, like Ruby on Rails and uh, Drupal, I think. Now, essentially, these days they're all optimized in terms of load time um, when it comes to the core code that they use. So this is not really an issue that differentiates one from the other. But what will actually um, make a difference is the kind of content that then you put on the page itself. You know, if you're putting on, on the page non-optimized uh, images, for instance, and they take a little bit of loading time, um, that tends to accumulate. If you are not using um, 
uh, in, in a sufficient um, if you're using too many social media sharing tools and they take an extra time to load on the page so that that adds to the loading time of the page itself so you need these are the things which you need to take into account so when you look at the loading time of your page consider what tools are necessary uh, consider if your images are well optimized and obviously um, you know you need to make sure that some of the basics on the site like you know the CSS um, is actually coded properly, but this is this is more development work. Good, good. We have one more comment here. And we have a question in the room. Oh, we have a question in the room. Let's do that first. Danielle. Danielle. <laughs> Just uh, going back um, a minute, what's the number one thing that a new small business just opened to do on Google versus a small business that's been um, What's the number one thing that a new business can do on Google or Google Plus? Google. On Google Plus, as opposed to maybe one that's established on Google Plus or just established in business, just in, and just an older business. Well, they both need to have a web, you know, a business page on Google Plus because that gives them a distinct identity which Google can see and. Um, then that can be linked to all the different personalities. But what the brand new business should be doing beyond that is actually using a real person to drive the connection forward, to drive the develop and the voice. Um, a lot of uh, established businesses um, use that approach in Google Plus because they started off with business pages. Um, they didn't get a lot of traction in terms of engagement and follower numbers and interaction. So then they had to use their own personal profiles to join the conversation. And once people began to associate a person with a business, then they were a lot more um, confident, you know, uh, and interacting and engaging with a business and then a lot, lot of times actually, you know, suggesting it to people who are potential customers and so on. Very good, very good. Okay. I suppose uh, I, could, I would summarize this as, as be human, right? Yeah, <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, George has one. It's at the bottom of your list there. Yeah, that one right there. He was talking about the difference between profiles and a business page. Yes. And uh, maybe you could kind of delineate that a little bit because that oftentimes I think confuses people of when to use the personal profile and when does the page fit in and how do you put those together? <laughs> okay. I mean, that's a great question. It comes up again and again. Now, if we think about it, you know, people actually like connecting with people and that's how we hardwire to establish, to assess and establish trust in somebody. So really being human, using a human profile, using a personal profile should be first for a business in order to build the engagement, interaction and connection with the audience. On the back of that, there should be a business page if it's a, you know, a business that does something very specific. The difference between the two is that the human side is going to be a lot more playful perhaps because, you know, the way we are as people. And the business side is going to be a little bit more serious because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business. So when you actually look at a business page, you don't really want to see kittens being shared there because, you know, <laughs> that's not what a business does, right? Unless you're into kitten breeding. <laughs> but you go into in the, the person's profile and you see a picture of share, you know, a cute kittens being shared, and you go, oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> <laughs> That's the perception thing. Okay, trust, bear in mind, there's a process to creating trust. It goes through contact, um, perception, assessment, and connection. These are the four steps. We apply the same four steps when it comes to a person or it comes to a business, but the context for each is going to be different. So a business is going to be more serious and more business orientated and solution orientated and I expect to see different things there, hence the perception thing. For a person, I don't expect them to be a marketing robot where you know every message they share is about their business and you know, please click here to find out what we do. I don't care about that. I want to care, I want to find out who you are, what makes you tick, why are you interesting? Why should I interact with you and give you my attention? So this you know, this is where the human element comes in. Yeah, one of the things I just want to throw a comment on that that last thing you talked about is I monitor a, a community on Google Plus. Maryland does too, and with their, they, oftentimes you have the introduce yourself category, and it's amazing how many people will not take the time to really introduce themselves as a person. A, as a person, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it it's like they don't get it. I yes. I, I don't understand that. I mean. Tell it's, me who you are. I want to know you. And, and, we, and that's really valuable. And you're talking about it right here, how important it is. 
So it is. It is incredibly important. We we have for a long time used social media as a cheap way to amplify a one-to-many message. And we thought, oh, finally we'll have the broadcasting power of a television station at our fingertips. And it doesn't really work that way. You know, the only way you can really amplify your message is to talk one-to-one -one and allow the person you connect with to be so enthused about who you are and what you do that they tell somebody else. And that's how you achieve scale and amplification. So it really has to be one-to-one, -one, and you have to be real for that. Right, right. Okay, um, Michael uh, Mason uh, posted a couple of questions earlier before the show, and I want to now ask him for him. Uh, okay. The first one is, how can the design community, the, you know, the web design community as a whole, uh, work together to help small businesses? Do you have some kind of tips for the small yes. web yes. developers absolutely. out there in terms of yes, helping them? Yes, absolutely. I think if you're a small business, you don't really have the expertise and the skill to know what you're paying for when you actually go to a web developer. So they can basically rip you off, okay? and you're hoping they won't. Okay? And some yeah. won't and some will. Now, here we in Google+, Plus, we actually have direct access to professionals. The, a very open, transparent discussion can happen there where you say, you know, this is what I want, and this is what I think I should be paying for, and this is what I'm hoping it'll do. Will it do it? And they will actually tell you. So basically what you're doing there is exchanging knowledge. They are educating you, and they're also establishing their presence in front of you. So when it comes to you making a purchasing decision, you actually know what you're paying for, and hopefully you also know who to go to. And that's a win-win for everybody. And that can happen very easily within that community. Yeah, his last question is, do you see April 20, the 21st of April as a significant day for small businesses? Uh, the mobile whole thing. Yes, I, I know. Well, that's when, uh, okay, for <laughs> everybody else, this is when Google said they're going to take a mobile presence as a ranking signal. Now, they've also said that they're not going to do it for every business um, across the web because not everybody should have a mobile website. So really, it depends on the kind of business you have. Now, most businesses will have a mobile presence. I mean, you can be on Google Maps. You can be on Google My Business. So that will come up on, on, on local search on your phone. Um, if you have a website and your business is the kind of business that actually does need a local presence, a mobile presence, um, then by all means, you should be taking this into account. But you know, don't think that, oh, absolutely everybody should. And right now, I can't think of any business that shouldn't, having said that. <laughs> but you know, there are some businesses, obviously, that don't, which is why Google said, you know, we're not going to, to make this a requirement for everybody with a website. But you know, if you should be on mobile search, it should be there. I'm going to get back to your book uh, for a moment. Okay. And um, one, your step number 16 or chapter 16 was on uh, Google Hangouts, Google Plus Hangouts on Air, which is what, of course, what we're doing right now. And um, you say that video marketing done right is the only shortcut you have to building trust on the web. Now you've yes. already talked about how critical trust is, but can you talk a little bit, or would you talk a little bit about what video marketing done right looks like? Yes, I mean, this is what it shouldn't look like. You know, if we have this kind of hangout, and I, I lead on with, hello, my name is David Amerland. I write books which you need to buy. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we, you know, this is the old traditional thing, right? Where, you know, you ask me a question, I say, oh, yes, answer this in my book. It's on Amazon. You know, we think, what? Why are we talking to you? Why are we having this connection? Why are you being a robot? Why are you selling to us when you're supposed to be talking? You know, this is not the way we interact as people. So essentially, Hangouts on Air are very disruptive because they allow the human element to come across. And if I'm going to be a dork and say, I'm not going to answer your question because I, it's my book on chapter, you know, whatever, and you need to buy it, you think, oh, go away. <laughs> because this is not the way discussions go. But if we have a discussion, you ask me something and I, basically give you an answer which convinces you of my expertise. You think, oh, well, you know, maybe that book will help me. And it's the same approach that any business can take. Um, this is the same way that you basically establish trust and connection in a very human thing. You actually get to see the person behind the book, the person behind the product, the person behind the website. And the moment you do that and you know who they are, you've connected with them. You've actually understood they're a person who does something, has some kind of expertise, has some kind of passion for what they do. and you know, you want to do business with them. So this is why Hangouts on Air done right is that human connection. That's where you establish trust very quickly. Now, 
could I take away the hangout on air and establish my expertise and authority in, in what I do? Well, yes, I would, but I can and I do. But it takes a lot of writing, a lot of time, a lot of engagement, a lot of interaction. I have it as a writer. Yes. Uh, you know, if you're if you're working as a small business, you don't have that luxury. I totally get that. You know, you can't, you know, wait for three months to produce, you know, thirty articles which have sufficient depth to allow people to engage and interact, and then create the authority and expertise which allows them to determine that you have the business to go to. But if you have a hangout on air and connect with people, well, you can do that in fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes, and I think that's brilliant. Okay, uh, Bernice has a question for you. Um, on, uh, yeah, down, down, right there. Whoop, up, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, um, please give us some information about your new books. But we, do have, <laughs> we, we do have, we do have those links in the event uh, page uh, to, to Amazon even. Boy. <laughs> We're trying not to sell here, but we yeah. do love the books. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, David has a bunch of books. Uh, here's one. Uh, this is the one that we're, we're talking, talking about, about today. And uh, David, maybe you just give a little summation of the book. Oh, for our yeah, absolutely. I mean, SEO help essentially is very practical. I've packed there very little theory, even though semantic search is something I'm really passionate about, and I love the theory part of it. But I've packed very little theory, and it's very practical, simply because it's it's you know for for a very actionable point um, kind of audience. So really, you know, you can go to any chapter, start from any chapter, go through the ten steps, you know, read the chapter. It's about every chapter is between five and ten pages, mm -hmm. and then you you follow the ten questions at the back of the chapter, at the end of the chapter, and they help you clarify everything you should be doing. And the moment you start doing those things, things start working for you. And if you do it for you know six chapters out of twenty, that's quite a lot of things you've actually joining up. So you know it will help you regardless. Of, yeah. Obviously, if you buy it, I expect you to do all 20 chapters because you really, <laughs> it really will help. But you know, I totally get you know that time is critical, and you know, doing something is always better than, than doing nothing. Yeah. Well, having said that, um, are there priorities? I know you could each of the steps is a standalone, um, but if you were going to say, okay, I, I know I'm only going to get to maybe four or five, three or four, where do you have priorities or where people should start? Well, um, the the first chapter is really inescapable because you need a Google right. account. Yes. And you need a Google account because it becomes central to your digital identity. But once we get past the first chapter, uh, after that, it really, from a small business perspective, it comes down to what are you good at. If you're good at taking pictures, if you're good at sharing memes, if you're good at creating hashtags, you know, there are chapters that actually help you. So go for your strengths first, and then you build on everything else. Oh, I love that. Go for your strengths, okay. Sounds like uh, something teachers, uh, you could be a teacher, well you are a teacher, David, because that's what we <laughs> believe as teachers too. I'm a former teacher, for those of you who don't know, and, and yes, building on strengths, that's key. Um, there's a section at the back of the book which also was really great. It was uh, an FAQ section of, of questions that David uh, hears repeatedly. And one I wanted to bring up is uh, when you mention CEO, uh, SEO sorry, to an audience, usually there's two things that do pop up in people's minds, keywords and links. So yes. I thought maybe, uh, David, before we close here that you could uh, – Go over. We know keyword stuffing's gone. We, we, we're, I think everybody knows that. But what is then? Where do is the keyword importance now? And what about those long tail phrases? Are those things that people still need to be um, thinking about? Well, Google is looking at at search queries as opposed to keywords. And the difference between that is that you know I can go into Google search and put in some keywords which I think are going to give me the whatever I'm looking for. And rather than Google looking at the keywords per se, it's actually going to try to understand my intent behind the search. So it tries to understand what am I looking for beyond those keywords and tries to give it to me. So really just thinking content in terms of keywords, that is seriously handicapping yourself. You really need to think, what does my audience need to know about what I do? If I do landscape gardening, they shouldn't really be looking for landscape gardening. They should be looking for, you know, maintaining 
the garden during winter, for instance? What do I need to do to make sure that I have the best garden in the neighborhood in the summer? What are the you know low maintenance flowers or plants I need to plant there? You know, these are the things which a gardener really um, gets paid to tell somebody because that's their knowledge. This is where you you actually show your expertise, and by putting that. Uh, out there and answering those questions, you begin to basically um, come up in terms of, of what you're actually um, doing and how you do it. So that's where keywords come in. And you know, obviously, you're going to be using some keywords, but you shouldn't overly focus on that. Focus on answering the questions. Now, in terms of links, you know, people used to go, "Oh, what I need to do is buy some links because links are important. And if I have links to my website, my website is important." And now we know that you know this strategy doesn't work anymore. Google is looking um, at links which are basically um, very targeted at a website, which means that if a link is pointing to you, they're not going to see just what the link is pointing to you, but also where is it pointing up from, what neighborhood is that in, what's the context, what is the context on the, context on the page. So really, if the link is pointing simply because you paid somebody to do it, Google will see it, and it's not worth it. You know, This is really risky behavior. So what I would say is forget about links, because you're going to earn them if you are good enough in terms of your content. And if your content appears in many different areas, people are going to quote you and share it and link to it. And also we have something called transient linking, which is the links which come from social media networks, whether it's Twitter or Google Plus or even Facebook sometimes. And you know, if you share something great there and that gets reshared and talked about, etc., that's building up a bunch of links and a bunch of, a bunch of um, transient web pages which point to your website. And, and Google can see that. They understand that, ha, something important is happening. You're talking about seasonal planting, for instance. And people are reacting to that and resharing and pointing it. So they understand the, the importance of, of what you're doing. So you know, you shouldn't really worry about links in the traditional sense of the word. That's a discredited and very dangerous SEO strategy these days. Perfect. Very good. Very good. Well, we are approaching the end of the hour, and so um, just to wrap things up, do you have some parting thoughts or um, conclusive type statements that you could give us before we sign off? Yes. Uh, well, what I'm going to try and do is actually answer as as quickly as I can within a closing statement, some of the issues that were brought up before the Hangout started started here. Um, and, and, and they were things like how, how do you integrate it or how do you use SEO on your website and social media? How do you use Facebook? Now, it doesn't matter what social media network you use. I mean, Facebook has its, its uses, but you've got to remember that in terms of search, Facebook is a walled garden. What happens in Facebook stays in Facebook, which means that you know, if you're working in Facebook only, or if you're working primarily within Facebook because you're familiar with it, then you need to start an entire, entirely new layer of work to start surfacing in search. If you're working in Google+, whatever you do there will actually surface in search and actually helps you there, so you're killing at least two birds, if not more, with one stone. Yes. No. The other thing which you should be doing is you're creating a digital footprint in every digital platform that you go on, whether you go on Twitter or, social, or, or Facebook or, or LinkedIn or Google+. Now, all this needs to be linked. So somebody finding you on Facebook, for instance, should be able to find your website, should be able to see your Twitter account, should be able to find your G+, account if possible, and they should be able to find you on LinkedIn, and vice versa. So basically, by linking all this up, you're creating greater authority from a search point of view in who you are, greater trustworthiness in you as a real person, or as, a, as opposed to a spammer or a bot, and that also is a, is a vote of confidence when it comes to search. And when it comes to establishing anything in terms of what you're doing in a very competitive environment, there's the old saying that you know, you've got to be you because everybody else is taken. And that's <laughs> really, really true. <laughs> this is what you've that. got to do. You've got to think, who am I? Really, why am I doing the things am I doing that I'm doing? How am I doing them differently? Answer those questions and then work really hard to establish the value of what you do, who you are, and how you do it in everything you do. And if you do all those things, then suddenly you, everything you do online begins to make sense in terms of bringing you money, bringing you um, customers, bringing you authority and expertise, and, and making it worth your, worth your while, which is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Very good. Beautiful. Well, um, I'm going to add to your parting thoughts by quoting you, David, from your <laughs> famous last words in the book, because uh, as a small business person, it, it's 
exactly how I feel also. Um, you say that uh, you feel that SEO represents an opportunity, the chance to prove that armed with a little knowledge, a website, a good business plan, and passion, a small business can create as good an experience and presence on the web as a big one and do it better. The semantic web, again, is the great equalizer. So uh, I just think that's a perfect way to close out and um, cannot thank you enough for... Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. For being brilliant at, in the middle of the night in Greece, you're still brilliant no matter what time of day it is. So, yeah, thank next, you. Next uh, month. And next month, um, we on the second Tuesday, and I, the date escapes me, <laughs> but we have coming up next month uh, Martin Shervington, and we'll be talking more about Google Plus then. So this will be a perfect follow-up to the kinds of uh, part of the discussion we had today on Google Plus um, with uh, Martin Shervington, who is a master at using. Google that, Plus for Business. Yes. That's what it does. Plus Google, my business. Exactly. So, <laughs> so that'll be really exciting. We're gonna, and a perfect follow up to today's yeah, talk. It, it will follow up really good. So thank you very much, David. We really appreciate your time. Uh, and I'm sure everybody that's watching is, is going to get a lot out of it. And get that book, read that book, yeah. go for it. Okay? Let's give him a hand. <laughs> thank thank you. you. And thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next month.